This morning we're talking about the tough stuff of relationship. Amen. Hallelujah. And we're going to look at the idea of finding peace and finding wisdom in our relationships. And if we're all truthful and honest with each other, you would all say, I need a little bit more wisdom in my decision making in my relationships. And we would say, some of us, you might be going through, man, I need, I need some peace in my relationships. I need some internal peace because the fact that I'm living in anxiety and stress and pressure and my relationships are causing these things in my life, I need some peace. I need to find some more peace in my life. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning that peace and wisdom are available to you. That Jesus Christ himself is peace and he is wisdom and he wants to give them to you. Hallelujah. He does. He wants to give them to you. He can only give us what he has. And if I gave you something that didn't belong to me, I would be uh, giving you something that I didn't have the right to give you. If I took a $50 bill from Pastor Bill and then gave it to you, I could happily and generously give it to you. In fact, if he wanted to do that, all of you would be putting up your hands saying, yeah, here I have it. But it didn't really come from me. It came from somebody else. It's not mine to give you. And he'll probably come and tap you on the shoulder and say, I want it back. Um, but God, our Jesus, he is peace and he has wisdom and he has, they are his nature, they are who he is and he offers them and he gives them to you and to I. In fact, our inheritance, our right as a child of God, as a son of God, yes, as we've sang this morning, it is love and being in that love, but it is also our right and our heritage and our privilege to have peace and to have wisdom. They are ours. They belong to us. They're our inheritance as children of God. But we need to live in them. We need to walk in them. We need to take hold of them. We know peace is a fruit of the Spirit. It's yours. It's available to you. But so often we don't find our relationships in that place. Sometimes we don't find ourselves acting and living in that place of peace or living and acting and making decisions that uh, are wise. <clears throat> if we don't have wisdom, we will struggle to have peace in our life. If we are consistently making bad decisions or unwise decisions, we are going to disturb the peace in our heart but also the peace in our relationships. But the reverse is also true. If we don't have peace in our heart and we're anxious and worried and stressed out on the inside, we are going to make rushed, quick decisions that are not necessarily wise decisions that are going to cause us even more trouble. So we need peace and we need wisdom. Let me tell you a little story. I want you to think of a nice, hot, tropical day. Uh, humidity is going through the roof. It's a hot day, I'm lying on my bed, got the fan on going full bore and I'm still sweating and then all of a sudden the power goes off, there's a blackout which is very common in Port Moresby. So I'm lying on my bed hot and sweaty and because of that my dad had actually bought us a, um, a battery operated fan uh, which held four D-sized batteries on it and it hangs about a metre above, a metre and a half above our bed and Sandra said I will get up and turn on the, um, the fan, and I said, fantastic. So she got up and turned it on, and I don't know how she did this, but she managed to drop the fan from a meter and a half above my head to onto my head, straight into my face. Um, so I'm hot and sweaty, and now I've got a fan planted on my face. Um, my peace was disturbed. <laughs> so my immediate response was, and you won't believe this because you think I'm a great pastor and a man of God and blah, blah, blah. I said, you're hopeless. To which Sandra jumped off the bed, stormed out of the room and slammed the door. Um, and I, so I took the fan off my face and put it to her side and walked out of the room and begged her for forgiveness and said, I didn't mean it. I shouldn't have said that and asked for uh, forgiveness and apologized because I knew if I didn't, do that and was unwise and continued to say, well, you dropped the fan on my head and my reactions were justified, uh, there would be no peace in our home for a period of time. So the wise decision was to humble myself, even though I had the imprint of a fan on my face, <laughs> and say, darling, I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I was wrong. I'm bad. Please forgive me. Um, and that is actually a true story. Embellished a little bit, but 
Um, that was basically how the events um, panned out. But how often in life do we say things that can continue to disturb the peace in our life? How often in life do uh, things happen, situations and circumstances going on around us cause us to uh, make decisions and say things that are not wise? Both of those happened to me right in that moment. And it could have had long-term impact. But I immediately took hold of it and said, no, I've got to be right here, got to be wise. Those words were not right. Um, and I assured my wife that she wasn't hopeless. She was wonderful and fantastic and beautiful and gorgeous and all those sorts of things. Hallelujah. Which is true. And you should all say amen to that and give me a clap for saying that. Hallelujah. Well, King David, he also had an opportunity to, where he allowed his inaction and his unwise decision to do nothing to cause ongoing disturbance and trouble in his family. His king, his, one of his sons gets involved or forces one of his, his sister to have a sexual relationship with him. Um, and that son is not confronted by the king. David doesn't take action. He doesn't do anything. He had and should have made a wise decision, brought justice into that situation as the king and as a father should have brought justice, should have taken action, but left it undone. Didn't do the right thing and didn't make a wise decision. So then another one of his sons is so angry that years later brings murder, comes and murders his brother, which then causes more disturbance to the family more lack of peace in the family. So his lack of action caused disturbance to the family. How often for us, we just sit back and just let things pass us by when we should have stood up for justice, we should have said something, we should have taken action, and we don't. And it brings long-term consequences of a lack of peace in our life. So a few thoughts on peace. You need to fight for peace. Yes, I said earlier that peace is ours, it's our birthright, and I'll look at that a little bit more, but we need to fight for peace. Situations and circumstances may not change. Situations and circumstances going on around you may not be full of peace. They may cause you to have anxiety, stress, and pressure. So you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to work hard at having peace in your life. There's a whole heap of scriptures. Let's have a look at Matthew 5. Verse 9, it says, Blessed is the peace, are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Romans 14, verse 19, it says, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace. Every effort, everything, that's fighting, that's working hard for peace. We, need, we want peace in our life, we have to work for it. Ephesians 4, 3 says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace peace. That's work again. Hebrews 12, 14 says the same thing. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. That's fighting for it. That's working towards it. In our second year of missionary service in Papua New Guinea, our first year was a tough year. We had three floods in our house. Uh, all the family got malaria except for myself. Uh, my dad was diagnosed with a, a serious sickness and I got held up at gunpoint and they took our car. That disturbed my peace. Um, that was our first year of missionary service. And then, but in the second year, I was given the responsibility to run our Bible college. There's about 50 to 60 students who are full-time living on the property. I am responsible for their welfare, their food, their health. Uh, it, was, it was like running a 24-hour, two-year young adults camp. Um, and we are living there with them. There's no break. There's nothing. I've got staff that I don't fully understand. They don't fully understand me. Uh, there's cross-cultural issues happening. Um, I'm having to discipline students. I'm getting reaction from some of the students. I've got staff issues going on as well. I had about six to seven staff. Um, a couple of them were giving me headaches, pressured, on the go, day and night, no break, and I am not at peace. So I walked into one of our other missionaries' Uh, officers, and we we're just talking, and she could see how that I wasn't at peace. And we just had it made a few comments, had a bit of a laugh, said some things. And then, as I was walking out, she said, Isn't peace already ours? And she just said that. She didn't say, Thus say of the Lord, or give me a prophetic word, or God is saying this to you. But as I walked out, those words resonated with my heart. And I went straight back to the house and started to look at what do the scriptures say about peace? Is peace 
based on my situation or my circumstances or is my peace based on what God has done for me? Is it my birthright? Is it, does, it, does peace really belong to me? Am I already in peace and I've just got to take hold of it? Or am I, is it something else? And I realized as I studied the scriptures that I need to fight for peace, yes, but it's also my right. It's my inheritance. Peace is mine. Isaiah, 50, uh, sorry, Isaiah 9 verse 6, talking about our Jesus, says, He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That Prince of Peace is our, my Jesus. That's my Jesus. He has the Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace. That means he has ownership of what peace is. And he can give it to you and to me. So in that moment, he said, I want to give you this peace. I want you to take hold of this peace. It's yours. John 14 verse 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. My heart was troubled. My heart was worried. I had a whole heap of things going on in my life. And God is saying, peace, I give it to you. I'm leaving it with you and I'm giving it to you and I'm not giving it to you as the world gives it. I'm not giving it to you so I can get something back from you. I'm not giving it to you to gain something from you. I'm giving it to you because I own it and it's mine to give to you. Man. That was a revelation for me. That was a shift in thinking for me. To realize as a child of God, peace is my birthright. And it is also yours and God wants to give it to you. In fact, he's already given it to you. We need to take hold of it and live in that place of peace. If you look at Philippians 4 verse 6 and 7, I won't read it out. But to fight for peace, we, we fight it through our prayers and petitioning and giving thanks to God. You can have a look at that scripture when you go home and just study about getting rid of anxiety and finding it and translating that anxiety into peace through prayer, petition and waiting on God. And for me, it showed a lack of faith. I had to transition from faith into a place of releasing my anxieties and pressures and stresses and actually trusting the Lord. We will have peace of mind when we have the mind of Christ. You will have peace of mind when you have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 to 10 says this, However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. So there's big things there. God who knows all, sees all, looks down on from heaven, and he sees you, he loves you, and he has great things prepared for you. And no eye has seen it, no mind has conceived it. It's from, that is an Old Testament scripture. But, verse 10 says this, but God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. Hallelujah. His Holy Spirit that dwells within you is revealing God's thoughts to you. His mind is available to you. His thinking is available to you through the Spirit. What a promise. We think, oh man, I need wisdom, I need peace, but it's available to you. Verse 16 says, goes on, says, For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. That has been a very important verse to me over the last nine years. But I have the mind of Christ. Have you got that understanding? Have you got that revelation, that, that thought, that you can think God's thoughts, that you can think the thoughts of Jesus Christ. That in your troubles and circumstances that are difficult, you can think God's thoughts. You can have his mind. We had a friend, a church member, a number of years ago up in uh, Papua New Guinea who basically, her, the company she worked for basically employed the devil. This lady was employed by her and she was a real nasty piece of work. Uh, our friend, our church member, great Christian young, uh, she's not young, great Christian lady, um, but loved God, but this lady came in and her job, she put it as her job, it was to sabotage her. Smile at her face, say all these wonderful things, but then behind her back she's criticizing her, stabbing her back, going to her bosses, making up stories, 
uh, writing letters that are just untrue, fabricating the truth, taking little bits of the truth and making them into this story that are not true and attacking our church member. This lady needed the mind of Christ and she needed the peace of God. In fact, the lady that I'm talking about who was employed up there, she was actually an Australian lady who actually had made it to the level of a current affair here in Australia and they had done reports on her on how corrupt she was, how she would take people's money and not pay her debts. Her and her husband were a nasty piece of work. She ended up in Papua New Guinea and working with our, our friend. But our friend, in all of that, we talked through with her. But this was disturbing her peace. She didn't have, she was trying to say, God, I want your mind. And she was able to, in the midst of all of it, say, I'm not going to fight back. I'm not going to attack. I'm going to do what is right. I won't be abused, but I'm going to stand and have peace. This lady was trying to get her sacked. And it got to the level where her bosses were actually actioning that. She was about to lose her job. Um, but she trusted the Lord. She stayed in a place of peace. She acted with dignity. She didn't fight back. Long story short, our Australian is now back in Australia. Um, I would have liked them to give her to the headhunters and the cannibals of Papua New Guinea. Um, but they sent her back to Australia. They sacked her and sent her back here. Um, so we are now worse off. But anyway, she's one of us. Um, but she was a nasty piece of work, and our friend still has her job. Um, but she was tested for a number of weeks on how she was going to act. Was she, would she lower herself? Her peace was under attack. Her wisdom was under attack. But she held the mind of Christ. She lived in that place of peace. Even when she was faced with losing her job, her, her, her character was being challenged daily. She was being criticized daily. Her bosses were believing stories that were not true. And maybe you're in the workplace and you're facing that. You've got a boss that is unreasonable. You've got people around you, colleagues that are unreasonable. But let me tell you, you can have the mind of Christ. You can have peace even when that is happening. Maybe you're a boss and you have staff that are just you're wanting to pull your hair out. God will give you wisdom how to deal with those staff. It's yours. You have the mind of Christ. You have pre peace from the Prince of Peace. Let's have a look at finding wisdom. We need peace and we need wisdom. And when we have, as I said, when we have peace of mind, we will have peace of mind when we have the mind of Christ. But that mind of Christ is also gives us wisdom. Proverbs gives us many scriptures about wisdom. Let's have a look at a couple of Proverbs that talk about wisdom. Proverbs 2 verse 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Hallelujah. What a promise. The Lord gives wisdom. It's available to you. How awesome is that? Proverbs 4 verse 7, wisdom is supreme, therefore get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. It may cost you something, but get understanding. What is it going to cost you to get the understanding that you need? What are you going to give up? What are you willing to pay to have wisdom? And let me tell you, you get wisdom and understanding, it'll cost you something, but man, the peace and the prosperity of life and the blessing and the joy that comes attached to that wisdom is going to be worth it. Every cent, every bit of time you give up, every bit of time you spend in the Word, every bit of time you spend at the feet of Jesus drawing wisdom from Him is going to be worth it because it's going to translate into your marriages, into your work, into your raising of children, into all areas of your relationships. It is worth the cost. Proverbs 10:23. It says, a fool finds pleasure in evil conduct, but a man of understanding delights in wisdom. Are you a man of understanding? Are you going to delight in wisdom? I tell you what, we need it. And we need to delight in it. We need to delight in the wisdom that is found in Jesus Christ and Him alone. We need wisdom for our relationships. I know I do. I need wisdom in every area of my relationships, every relationship I have as a pastor, as a missionary, as a father, as a husband, as an uncle, as a son, 
I need wisdom. We, each and every one of us needs a greater level of wisdom. So the Scriptures promise us, ask for wisdom and Jesus will, Jesus will give it to you. James 1 verse 5. Probably learned this verse in Sunday school. It says, if anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generous, generously to all without finding fault, and he will give it, and it will be given to him. Are you ready to ask for wisdom? If you need wisdom, and we all need more of it, but some of you are really facing struggles right at the moment, where you're confronted daily with struggles, and you're needing wisdom daily. Not just sort of a general, yeah, I'd like more wisdom, but you're facing it. You're going through it right now. And God is saying to you, ask him and he will give you wisdom for that situation or circumstance that you are going through. Without finding fault. That's good for me because you can ask my wife and she can find faults. You ask the Lord and he'll tell you a whole heap more faults. Um, but without finding fault, God will give me wisdom. Hallelujah. Even if I've, I'm in the situation or you're in the situation because of your own faults or bad decisions. God will give you wisdom of how to get out of that place, how to restore the things that were said that shouldn't have been said, how to rebuild that relationship. What a promise. Without finding fault, without putting blame on you because of this, yeah, you'll have to own up and take responsibility, but he will show you the way out. He'll give you wisdom how to rebuild, how to restructure, how to reorganize, and how to find a way through. Hallelujah. It's a promise. It's there for you. So take hold of it. Ask him and he will give you the wisdom you need. Wisdom in all areas of your relationships. For me, wisdom is consistently making quality decisions based on the principles of the Word of God. Day by day, consistently making good decision after good decision after good decision based on the promises and the Word of God. If we do that, man, our marriages will go up. Our relationships will go up. There'll be peace in those places. But so often we don't. So often we allow things in that don't, aren't wise, aren't touching it, the, living on the principles of God. So every time we, someone touches pornography, every time someone touches that, they are making a decision which has implications on their relationships, their intimacy. Even if you're not married, young men, even if you're touching those things before you get married and say, once I get married, it'll be over, you are breaking intimacy into your future. You're touching things that are not wise. How many marriages, how many relationships are struggling because of the f lack of financial spending or financial control of one of the partners? Finance is a huge issue in marriage. It's tearing marriages apart because one partner is spending, or both marriages are partners are spending and the debt is going up and it's causing so much pressure and stress. The Word of God gives us clear guidelines to live within our means. Be generous. Be content with what he has provided. All of it belongs to him. 100% is his. Not just 10%. 100% is his. He says, give a 10 back to me and 90%. Be content and live on that. But there are so many principles in the word of God where we need to be wise and make decisions on those principles. James 3 verse 17 gives us a great promise. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, consistent, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. What a promise. Man, if I was making decisions and living in that, that, that place all the time, man, how good would my relationships be? How good would your relationships be? If we transition to you, making decisions based on the wisdom of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So where are you up to? Where are your relationships at? Where is your decision making at? We need the wisdom of God. And if you need to ask, I'm here to tell you today, God without fault will give it to you if you ask. And at the end of the service, I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask for some wisdom and we'll stand with you in prayer. So we need to fight for peace. We need to ask for wisdom. But we also need to realize that we need to start growing in wisdom as well. And you might say, well, I have made so many bad decisions. How am I going to transition from bad decisions to making wise decisions? Well, there's a promise that you can grow in wisdom. Jesus did. 
In Luke 2, verse 52, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus grew in wisdom. As a little boy, he grew. This is not to do with education. This is not to do with how many degrees you have. I know some very smart people who are also very, very dumb. Hopefully you're not one of them. Sorry, that's insulting, is it? Um, But we know people, they can have university degrees, masters, PhDs, get to the top of that. But they relationally, they can't keep a relationship together. Financially, they can't get their finances together. They make bad choices. So wisdom is not based on information or how smart you are. I have a friend in Papua New Guinea. He's illiterate, um, but he is a very wise man. He can't read and write. From an education point of view, from a Western mindset, even from a Papua New Guinean mindset, you would say he's very uneducated. But he is a wise man. He is a wise leader, able to make good decisions. So it's not education-based. We might, but we need to grow in wisdom. And there's a promise there that we can grow. And maybe you think, man, my life has been full of unwise decisions. But there's a promise here that we can start to grow in wisdom. And we all need to be growing in wisdom. We need wisdom in how to raise our children. They start out as little babies and it's all a bit easier and lack of sleep, but we need wisdom there. And then they turn into teenagers and then you need some more wisdom. And then they go to university and become adults. And then you need wisdom on how to deal with them when they're at that different stage. It keeps changing. And when James was two and three, we thought we had it worked out. But then he turned five and six and seven and now he's 15. And the wisdom I had when he was two or three, if I keep acting on that wisdom, I'm in trouble. I've got to keep going. Got to keep learning. Got to keep growing in wisdom. How to deal as life situations and circumstances changed. We need wisdom. How to deal with the unreasonable boss or the staff member that's not pulling their weight. We need wisdom in making a choice of life partners. And I thank the Lord for Sandra, who um, God provi- provided for me as a, as a wife. But I had a girlfriend before her uh, who was a great girl. Um, but the wisdom of the Lord came to me. And God clearly spoke to me about this fr- girl that I was friendly with. And um, we'd been dating for a little while. God said to me, what's the call of God on her life? I said, oh, well, she wants to be a lawyer and live in the eastern suburbs and have a nice big house and a white picket fence and da 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 And the Lord said, yeah, that's right. And your call? Oh, I'm going to be a missionary. And the Lord said, do you think she will go to the mission field with you? And I said, no way. And the Lord said, well, she's not the right one for you. So I had to break it off. Um, and the Lord had the perfect angel and beautiful, gorgeous wife for me um, who was a missionary. We'd been in church together, hadn't looked at her once, and then the Lord opened my eyes, and man, I saw an angel from heaven, gorgeous and prepared, waiting for me. Hallelujah. But we need the wisdom of the Lord in making a choice of life partners. And that's just a little example, but it is a practical example of how God gives wisdom. Matthew 7, verse 24, says, Therefore... Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Hearing the word of God and then putting them into practice. How are you going with that? Listening to the voice of God. Hearing his voice. Seeking his wisdom. Getting his peace for your life. And then putting it into practice. And I know here you do your life journals. And I do my life journal as well. I do the, follow the same pl- program as you follow the same reading plan, and I have for the last nine years. And, um, but those life journals, for me, have been a time where I sit and wait on God, and I hear His voice, and when He speaks to me, then I put it into practice. When He talks to me, oh, that area is not right. This thing is, needs to be adjusted. This is what I'm saying to you. This is where I want you to go. This is what I want you to do. Man, I'm hearing the voice of God, getting the wisdom of God. Bill Hybels calls it chair time in his book, Simplified. If you haven't read that book, read it. It's a great book. For me, it's spending time with the invisible God. It's what Moses did. Moses, Hebrews tells us that Moses was able to endure and face Pharaoh and go through troubles and difficulties 
because he had seen the invisible God. Our chair time, our spending time in the Word, our spending time in the Scriptures and allowing the Spirit of God to speak to us and give us His mind, give us His heart to bring peace to our anxieties. That is meeting with the invisible God. And Moses was able to endure. Moses was able to go through and do what he did in life and have peace and wisdom and the courage to do what he did because he had met with the invisible God. He'd seen God. And you and I can see God. We can spend time with Him. We can sit at His feet. And the number one way that God does that for me is through my life journal, where I put aside time and I sit and I seek His wisdom. I seek His face. I spend time with Him. You can do the same thing. And I trust that if you're not doing your life journals or you're not, you don't have a regular, consistent reading program on time when you spend time with God, it's not so much about the reading, it's more about the hearing the voice of God And having the Holy Spirit speak to you. So sometimes I'll read half a chapter and God's already speaking and I just got to start writing down what he's saying to me and I don't finish the chapter. So it's not so much about the reading. It's actually about you hearing God's voice, meeting with the invisible God, getting his wisdom. And it's available to you. He offers them both to you today, wisdom and peace. Will you receive them from him? Will you receive wisdom and peace from Jesus Christ today? They are available to you. The Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ himself, the one who owns peace, he owns it and it's his. He offers it to you today. The God of all things, the God who created the universe is offering you wisdom. That difficulty you're facing, saying, here, I can give you some wisdom. Will you ask for it? Will you start to grow in it? Will you start to move in it? Hallelujah. On the cross, the biggest thing that causes us to not have wisdom and not have peace is our own sin and our own selfishness. And on the cross, Jesus Christ came and dealt with your sin and my sin. That biggest thing that would cause us to move away from peace, move away from wisdom, to chase after greed and selfishness and to do our own thing, to find, trying to find peace in something else or believing something else or our rebellious thoughts or our insecurities. All these things have been dealt with on the cross as Jesus Christ came and died for you and me, took away our sin problem, that he poured out his grace into your life and my life so that we could be secure, so that we could think his thoughts, so that we could be forgiven of our sins. The grace that saves us, the grace that sets us free, the grace that sends us to heaven is the same grace that brought you peace. It's the same grace that offers you wisdom today. And it's available to you. Hallelujah.